Welcome to Speak For Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That is my new co-host, Marcellus Wiley. Coming up, we'll tell you if Dak Prescott should be worried about his future in Dallas. Plus, what all the Steelers drama means for Mike Tomlin. But first, as always, we start off with our Whitlock. What you got today, big dog? Oh, I got a lot. Jerry Jones and Des Bryant were spotted at a Beyonce concert Tuesday night in Dallas. Hey. According to my unreliable, fictitious, anonymous sources, <laughs> when Bay performed Drunk in Love, Jerry and Des stood up, looked into each other's eyes, and said, how the hell did this ish happen? Oh, baby. <laughs> Drunk in Love is Des and Jerry's couple song. It was a smash hit in 2014, the year the Cowboys finished 12 and 4, Dez caught a career high 16 touchdown passes and was in the conversation for the best receiver in the league. That was then. This is now. Mm. Five months after Jones's Cowboys cut ties with the emotional 29 year old receiver, Dez Bryant can't find anyone to love him the way Jerry, Jerry once did, and Jerry can't find a receiver who can get off the line of scrimmage. Marcellus, you know exactly where this is headed. You tell me, dog. The Beyonce concert was the first step towards reconciliation. Jerry is thinking about moving Dez back into the house. My sources say Dez intentionally left his, mouth cleat, his mouthpiece and cleats in Jerry's house after the concert. Mm. We've all done this. Hate that. Dez and Jerry split up, dated around, and have both reached the conclusion they can't find anything better right now. Notice I didn't say they've fallen back in love. Nope. This is a pair that can't get any action right now, bumped into each other at their favorite nightclub, and went usher. Love in this club. <laughs> We've seen Dez sashaying from one NFL club to the next, looking for love. He turned down John Harbaugh, Joe Flacco, and the Baltimore Ravens early on, thinking he could do better. He went on a way too casual date with Hugh Jackson and the Browns. Dez wore shorts, a t-shirt, and headphones. He says the Browns sent him a contract proposal, but to me, the Browns basically told Dez, hey, we might give you a booty call later in the season. Ooh. Recently, Dez has been on social media wildly and aggressively flirting with the Patriots and the Redskins. He tweeted, if I line up next to Gronk, Hogan, Edelman, I'm for sure getting a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Plus, I won't be getting criticized, controlled for expressing my love for the game. Washington is cool as well. <laughs> right now, Des Bryant is an IG model mm. posting naked selfies with a personal email address for business purposes only. <laughs> Jerry's in no better shape. He's a wide receiver sugar daddy who has invested in sweet and slow rather than cane sugar. Mm. With Cole Beasley, Alan Hearns, and Deontay Thompson, the Cowboys don't have anyone to take the top off of defense, create running lanes for Ezekiel Elliott, and wide throwing windows for Dak Prescott. Marcellus, mm. I'm old school. I hear love it. Beyonce, love Usher, but this whole situation really reminds me of the stylistics. <laughs> they were an R&B group from Philadelphia in the 1970s. They had a song, Break Up to Make Up. Mm. That's all we do. First you love me, then you hate me. It's a game for fools. Mm. That pretty much summarizes Jerry and Des. But the funny thing is, I've been this kind of fool. And if I'm Jerry, I don't move Des back in. I lease him an apartment for six months while I continue to look for my wifey receiver. <laughs> Des Bryant makes sense <laughs> for this season. It's a short-term deal. What? He makes sense for this season, Marcellus. You, re you reconcile just for this season. Yeah. Because that's the only options on the table. Man, you got that dude online selling tummy <laughs> tea and, and, and sweet sweat, and you now saying, but that's going to be the one you want to go out with for this year. We went through too much for us to return back to this place. If I'm Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys, we cut you for a reason. And that reason is going to be echoed if you start to look at the relationship since that departure. Des Bryant's been online talking about everything but the Cowboys. And when he does talk about the Cowboys, it's in a negative way, right? So you're, you're looking at this the wrong way. I'm looking at him being with Jerry Jones as not a football move, not a opportunity to get on your roster. If so, he should have been up there with Stephen Jones because Stephen Jones is the one that's running football operations. Jerry Jones is the face of this franchise now. Oh. He's, ha he's handed those keys over to his son. You don't think he can get them back? Anytime he wants. He can't. 
he doesn't he doesn't want him back. And I'll tell you why he doesn't want him back, because he saw him before. And before, Dez was a star receiver in the conversation, greatest playing receiver at the time. Dez has regressed to a place where you talk and laugh at Cole Beasley, but Cole Beasley had a better year than Dez a year ago. Remember those times. So it's a difficult situation if I'm Jerry Jones because I have a great relationship with all my players. Everyone loves Jerry Jones, including me. I'm a former player. I only played one year with the Cowboys. Still love Jerry Jones. And just two days ago, Jason, just two days ago, dog, I was out with Dean Spanos and we had dinner. Yep. That's an own now. Owner of the Chargers. I, owner of the Chargers. And, and I was released by the Chargers. I don't want to say cut because we had a good dinner. <laughs> but, but he cut me. And, and, and we still have a great relationship, man. Go to the game, sit in this box, all that. And I uh, know I'm not an active player, but that relationship has continued even after the sad departure. I think this is just more uh, the same. Uh, okay, but hold on. Let's mm -hmm. stop right there. You, you can't leave. You're in a different place than Dez in terms of you're out of the league, you've been out of the league. Jerry has to know, is any type of flirtation with Dez as thirsty as Dez is right now, <laughs> he's going to read this. Oh, he wants to get back together. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. going to go to that delusional spot. It's just like why you can't return it. After you broke up, you can't return no text messages Nothing. for about a year. Right. No, no missed phone calls. You just have to ignore it all. You do anything in the first year of a breakup, the other person reads it as... Oh, I still got a chance. Oh, okay, but look, Dez, I get it. Dez wants to get back at the Cowboys, but he doesn't want to get back with the Cowboys. He, he want to get back. Check. I, he wants. No, well, he could have took the Baltimore check. He could have went to Cleveland, and instead of wearing the headphones and, and coming out of the gym, he could have actually walked in there like, "Yo, give me a job. I'm ready for this." I think Dez wants to show the Cowboys what they're missing, not come back to that roster and say, "I'm back and I've arrived." Why wouldn't Dez have watched last Sunday's game and said? The Cowboys know what they're missing. I know what they're missing. Jerry knows what they're missing. I, 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 I think Dez and Dallas, unfortunately, need each other right now because they have no other options. But let's take it all off the table mm. then. Why hasn't anyone signed Dez? He's been out here shaking his moneymaker for everybody. <laughs> and, <laughs> ain't nobody throwing no ones his way. <laughs> hey, right, right, right. Look, man, uh, let me hit you with a Wileyism. When personality trumps production, there's a problem. And that's the NFL. Three P's of football. <laughs> Three P's of football, brother. That is a problem. And if you see Des Bryant's production right now, and then you know you're going to hear the echo of that voice and this guy who's showing passion, but it's passion when you're Tom Brady yelling at your coach and you're winning. But when you're not catching the ball to the tune of 50 catches and 600 yards and Cole Beasley's outshining you, and then you over there poking your finger at Dak and Zeke is sitting there rolling his eyes, that's when it's a problem. And I just don't think in terms of chemistry, he's going to fit well with this Cowboys team as it's now Dak and Zeke's team. Okay, we both sat and watched the Cowboys and the Carolina Panthers. Yeah. And, and my issue here is just like, what are the solutions? If not Dez, who? Is there someone else on the sideline? Do you go out and make a trade? I, I don't, I, I see Dez as like the only option. At least he's a name, he's a threat. He couldn't be any worse than what we just saw this past week. Uh, I, I, I hate to disagree, but here we go. Dez in the last two years had regressed to a place where you were like, wow. Not only overpaid by those standards, but also wasn't fitting in with trying to have a winning culture in the way that they wanted it to go. So what happens? He gets released. And then this is when you know a player wasn't right for you. Oh, I'm coming back next year harder than ever. Oh, I can't wait to see. Wait a minute. In the NFL, because this is not a privilege, this is not just you're going to be handed this as a blessing, you got to earn this every single day. And now this is the year, this is the offseason, this is the time where you're going to start to separate. This is the time we're going to get you off the, the, the press coverage. Jazz, we saw you the last two years. You didn't want to get off the press coverage then? So you thinking there's going to be a change of behavior, he's going to turn over a new no, leaf? No, no. It's not. I what did Baltimore see then to even offer him a contract? 
they got a scouting report department. Right. Ozzie Newsom's supposed to be pretty good. John Harbaugh pretty good. They saw something, at least we've been told, that made them think that oh, was yeah. the value. You know how the game goes, because I've been there. I played for four different teams. This is how it goes. You play for the first team, you're like, look, if y'all don't pay me, I'm out. I'm going to get my big money. Then you play for the second team, you got your big money. If you don't perform, you will get released and land somewhere else, and all they're going to sit there and say, you just needed a change of scenery. You just needed a breath of fresh air. That was Dallas for me. And then I got to practice, and Bill Parcells looked at me in the first practice and said, that's all you got, Wiley? And I was like, yep. <laughs> and the next thing you know, I'm out of Dallas. I'm telling you, I am not rooting against Des Bryant. But this is standard operating procedure and behavior of someone who knows the better days are behind them, but still trying to sell the future. All right, Jerry, leave Dez alone. Don't be leading him on anymore. All right, welcome back. I'm Jason Whitlock. He's Marcellus Wiley. Time for the big stories of the day. Let's start with Thursday night football, where the Bengals host the Ravens tonight on the NFL Network. The Ravens demolished the Bills in week one with Lamar Jackson lining up all over the field and even leading a touchdown under, from under center. Meanwhile, the Bengals took down Andrew Luck and the Colts with a big game from second-year running back Joe Mixon, who A.J. Green says is as good as Le'Veon Bell and Todd Gurley. All right, two young stars, mm. potential young stars, two guys, Joe Mixon because of some criminal activity early in his college career, right. was a controversial draft pick. Lamar J Jackson because is he a receiver, is he a quarterback? That controversy, two guys that had performed well at the college level came to the NFL with some controversy. Uh, I think Mixon has more upside. Mm. I think that, and, and I'll say this, you, you love to play the uh, star game in terms of, <laughs> Joe Mixon was a five-star guy for a reason mm. coming out of high school, the number one running back coming out of high school. Lamar Jackson was a three-star guy. Joe Mixon, without the baggage of what he did in Oklahoma, could have been one of the first two or three picks in the draft. I think he has the most upside. Uh, you're giving us a talent conversation to <laughs> talk about. Okay, so you want to go five stars. And maybe if you look at Lamar Jackson, he's a later bloomer than uh, a Mixon is. But who won the Heisman again? Uh, stars to the side. Who won the Heisman again? <laughs> and Lamar then, Jackson. And, and then who actually returned the next year and had a better performance but didn't win the Heisman just because his team lost games? The same Lamar Jackson. So I'm going with Lamar Jackson. We're talking potential. You're talking talent. If you're talking potential, not kinetic energy, not what happened in week one, I'm talking about body of work, watching Lamar Jackson dominate the collegiate level. And then he gets to the pro level, and in his first game, just in impact, just in presence, just in fear of a defensive coordinator for the Buffalo Bills sitting there saying, I have the game plan for this dude. 47 points by Baltimore. He lines up all over the field. No, he wasn't always the guy that got the ball and moved the chains, but his presence had an effect. A oh, presence of Joe Flacco, Michael Crabtree, yeah, yeah. Willie Sneed. They got it done. The people that actually got in the end zone. <laughs> right. I get it. And, and come on, Marcel, we know this about a lot of things you do in college don't translate to the NFL. Yeah. And so... I'm just, Joe Mixon, from the time he was 10 years old, he ran like a pro running back. There's some Agreed. Eric Dickerson in him. There's, there, there, this dude is a beast. You can see it at 10 years old, like, that's an NFL running back. When you watch Lamar Jackson in college, high school, whatever, you're like, that's a great college quarterback, potentially. It's very sketchy whether he's a great NFL quarterback. And so that's when I'm talking about. NFL upside, and I know we've devalued the running back position. Yeah. But having a guy that A.J. Green, which I, I think he's right, he could be a Gurley, he could be a Le'Veon Bell, that's a lot of upside. Man, you got to stay on the cutting edge of football. You know all these things happen fast. I get it. You old school, Fedora. You're keeping it one ring in the ear. I get it. Next level is what Lamar Jackson is. Mike Vick plus. Mike Vick 2.0, more accurate than Mike Vick at the collegiate level, and as fast, if not faster. This dude is blurry. Coaches always say, run the tape. And if someone's blurry on that field, that's the guy that we have to watch out for. Speed kills. That narrative, that, that, that montage, that has not left the game. So when I'm looking at Lamar Jackson, his upside, no one else at the quarterback position possesses those qualities. Think about it. Who else has that kind of arm strength, 
accurate mid 50s high 50s I don't want to go there but he has to learn that position once he learns that position with that skill set sky's the limit Joe Mixon's being compared to other greats but there's could be something greater in Lamar Jackson let's go a tad bit deeper let's get a little closer to the ball turn it and so Marcellus as I sit here as a journalist mm -hmm. and so a lot of times I remove my personal opinions out of the argument because I'm just journalistic. I'm just going to be journalistic. How you going to do that? You're just completely objective right now. I, tr I try to. No, I try to be. That's the standard. As do a or journalist. do not. There is no try. But I, I, I'm I, listening. Right. <laughs> and so what I'm saying is that I get it. And I've as a fan, as a sports fan, you, my first love affair in football was James Harris, the black quarterback oh, yeah. for the Los Angeles Rams yeah, years yeah. ago. That's what made me captured my attention. And sitting in Indianapolis, I was a Rams fan. I've been rooting for the black quarterback since 1970, <laughs> what? whatever. And I've, I sit right. there and think like, man, one day we're gonna have the athletic what? quarterback is gonna take over football, and we're gonna it's gonna he be has. a rush. I don't think it's Aaron still, Rodgers is not athletic. It's still played from the pocket. It's a pocket game. Aaron Rodgers is great. Tom great Brady is better. And the guys that can play from the pocket, not risk injury, because again, when they're paying you 150 million dollars. They don't want you hurt. They don't want you out of that pocket. It's still a game about mastering the game from the pocket, and that's where I get it. Am I rooting for Lamar Jackson? Yes. As a journalist, do I step back and say, the way this game is played, it's played from the pocket. It's a hard battle for a guy who solved a lot of problems with his legs more than his arms going all the way through. Warren Moon, black quarterback, stayed in that pocket and threw that dart. All day, right? So yeah. it's not the, it's the mobile quarterback. And it's funny because then Aaron Rodgers is not considered uh, a mobile quarterback, but uh, don't let the paint job fool you. Yes, he is a mobile quarterback. I would agree. Right. He's a very rare bird Improv. in comparison to the Drew Breeses, the Peyton Manning, Thank you. Tom Brady, the right. guys that, Montana, all that. that turn out championships year after year. You're right. All right, to a big story out of Oakland where the Raiders are trying to figure things out after that ugly Monday night loss. Apparently, John Gruden's solution to their problems includes calling out his quarterback in the media, openly wondering why Derek Carr missed some wide open deep throws. But Carr says it's not all on him, with Raiders reporter Vic Teffer tweeting, quote, Carr said it's been a tough adjustment as Gruden wants him to throw it away and punt rather than make a mistake. We're trying to find that line together. This is a problem. Mm -hmm, big problem. Is a, you're paying the dude to be a playmaker and a franchise quarterback. There's been nothing about Derek Carr from college to pros that says he's a game manager. Mm -hmm. And and I, with your the, the defense the Raiders have, you can, this ain't a Brad Johnson. I got Warren Sapp, John Lynch, Derek Brooks, and everybody else, uh, Simeon Rice on the other side. The Raiders defense is garbage. They have to score some points here. You can't turn Derek Carr into a game manager. Yeah, well, he's doing it, and he's doing it effectively already after at least one week. Um, and it, it, this is what John Gruden does. Uh, it's not so much that I want to make you a game manager. It's the Simon Says culture. That means I'm Simon, and what I say, you do. And if you don't do that, then I'm always in your head. And if that doesn't work for you the way that you choose, you better come back to me and come back to me fast. And that's where Derek Carr is right now. He's mentally fried, it feels like, after one week. I, Derek Carr, after the game, went to the podium and described his second interception in that game. Just listen to how all over the place Derek Carr sounds about this throw. So I went to the right side. They buzzed underneath that route. So I came back, bad decision. I went to throw it away. Kind of maybe give the bench route a chance, but I saw the dude underneath it, so I tried to pull it back with my hand, and obviously that's why it looked so terrible. It just floated in there and landed in the guy's lap. So um, it, it's just one of those that you just you sit there and you're like that is one of the dumbest plays you could ever have. Um, but it is what it is. I I knew what I should have done as soon as that play was over, but it just sucks that it happened. 
classic paralysis by analysis. Overthinking. Overthinking. You know why he's overthinking? He got somebody else in his head telling him something that he's naturally not comfortable doing. Zigzagging mentally. And the guy will never be as great as he can be if he continues to try to play by John Gruden's program inside his head. I, I, I wish we could go back. This kind of changes my opinion from earlier in the week about I think Gruden's going to work. Mm. Uh, because, you know, we heard Cowherd say it at the end of his show in terms of Rich Gannon became an all-pro quarterback. MVP, MVP the MVP next year. After Gruden left. Yes. And then Gruden goes over there with Brad Johnson, who's limited, and then leans on Warren Sapp and all those guys basically to carry him to a Super Bowl. And so what I, what I think, we've fed the narrative that John Gruden is one of the two or three smartest guys in football. And 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 I've all I've always enjoyed the John Gruden QB camp. Yes, me too. But Love the it. QB camp is not football. That's a fake reality world sitting inside some booth and everybody's drawing up the plays. On the football field, the players have to be given the freedom to make plays. And I'm, I think his leash is too tight. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of times you get lost in X's and O's, but relationships and how you can get the most out of a player, so important. That's why I respect the Bill Belichick. Say what you want about the guy. You learn to have a relationship with him where you trust that he's going to call the right plays, put you in proper position, and you're going to be fully motivated to execute that. That's not John Gruden. If you look at what John Gruden has done, he simply has said, give me 10 years, $100 million, and who's the best player on defense? Khalil Mack, get out of here. Who's our best special team player? Marquette King, get out of here. I don't even want to talk to you. And who's our best player on offense? Derek Carr. Got up in his head to the point where now Derek Carr don't know which way to throw the ball. Derek Carr just said, I was going to throw it there, but it was a defender there. There's always a defender there. I was going to throw it there. It was another guy over there. Yeah, he's there too. Uh, and I just decided I don't know what to do with it, and I'm just going to let it go out of my hand. That's where he is, and he's getting mentally fried. Yeah, I think this is a mistake, and it makes me question John Gruden as a leader. You, you can't. It's, you can't put puppet strings on it. You can't. You got a young kid. You can't put puppet strings on him. No, not at all, man. Like I said before, <laughs> though, you, you create them. Adult? You create them, but you don't control them. And that's how the game goes. And that's what Gruden's trying to do. All right, welcome back. Marcellus and I are joined now by the NFL Network's Bucky Brooks. Let's move to Dallas, where Dak Prescott and the Cowboys host the Giants Sunday night, looking to bounce back from their week one loss to Carolina. Dak had a particularly ugly game against the Panthers. And now giant safety Landon Collins is making it clear the quarterback doesn't exactly strike fear into the Giants' defense. Honestly, it, it's just like you said, we just really got to focus on stopping Zeke, making sure that every run gap, every we playing our gap assignments, we making sure we close the air out of, um, of their offensive running game. If we do that, put the ball into deck uh, hands, I mean, I think we have a better shot of winning. Ooh, mm. uh, the noise <laughs> around a player, yeah, the noise around a player tells a lot about the player's situation. And, and I think this kind of public comments from Landon Collins going into a rivalry game, both guys need this win. That's an, Dak's on the hottest seat, I think, in the NFL. Honest to goodness. I, I, I think his job, his future in Dallas, they have no backup quarterback, but his future in Dallas doesn't look that bright right now in this moment. I think it's as, it's as hot a seat as there is player or coach in the NFL. He's got to perform this week. Oh, I mean, of course, you've got to perform everybody for job security, but I'm not worried about his job situation. One, you said it, uh, Cooper Rush time? Is, it, <laughs> is there a rush for Cooper campaign going on in Dallas right now? No, not at all. And we know uh, a man is as faithful as his options. And they have no options outside of Dak Prescott. You married yourself to this guy, and you let your other franchise player, who was up there in age, become a broadcaster. So once you marry a Dak Prescott, you have to allow this to mature. The first two years, we talked about it yesterday, his comps were around Cam Newton. His comps were very good. But of late, we have not seen Dak Prescott impress like we thought he could, in part, no receivers and a defense that has now regressed to the mean. No, I think the two biggest factors for Dak Prescott not playing well. When Zeke was absent last year with the suspension, 
he doesn't really play well when he doesn't have the benefit of the running game. And then that offensive line. For the longest time, we talked about the Dallas Cowboys having the most dominant offensive line in football. With well, the last year or so, those guys have been hurt. And without the threat of a solid running game, he's not the same guy. Let's be honest. I think Landon Collins deserves to be applauded for giving an honest take. This offense is driven by Ezekiel Elliott. Yeah. When you game plan to deal with the Dallas Cowboys, it's about stopping number 21, and you want to make Dak Prescott throw an obvious passing downs. He has to show people that to be an A-level quarterback, that he can thrive when everyone knows he has to throw. And this is who Landon Collins is. Like, let's not forget his mental makeup. Like, I'm going to attack. Remember him and Dez and all those rivalries? Uh, nobody out there now looking like Dez? Okay, I need some fresh meat. I need some new blood. Dak, I'm coming at you because we know Zeke is going to be the workhorse and he's going to be the guy. We used to call this, that's an honest take for a reason because in the locker room, in film study, we say something completely different mm -hmm. than we do at the podium. We used to call it limo. So coach would be sitting there and he hit him with the red bean. Boom, see that guy right there? Make sure you send a limo for him at the hotel game day. He has <laughs> to show <laughs> up for the game because we are going to abuse him. Crazy enough, Dak, they got the red beam on you, brother. They want you to show up. And you, you've made an excellent point. I love the analogy. I had never heard the limo deal. And that is why I'm saying I'm concerned because what Marcellus is saying is true. Landon Collins said that because they sat in the film room and saw what I saw, balls in the dirt, B balls that were just inaccurate, a guy that's confidence who looks shaken against the Carolina Panthers. And to me, I just can't blame it all. Oh, well, he doesn't have a running game. The ball doesn't climb out of the dirt just because you got a running game. <laughs> you you got to throw the ball properly. And so, yeah, they, they, they send in a limo for that. Yeah, the pressure is on him. When you look at these numbers, zero touchdown passes in six of his last nine, mm. fewer than 200 pass yards in seven of his last nine. Everyone in the defensive meeting room is saying, look, let's make him beat us because they don't believe that he can make it. And when you don't have any A-level wide receivers, they definitely want to make the Cowboys pass. Until Dak Prescott is able to beat people with his arm, the Cowboys will see a lot of eight and nine-man boxes with number four. I'm going to throw y'all a little bit of a curveball. Mm -hmm. Didn't prepare for this, but I just want to ask. Do we think Dak's position on the national anthem is the reason why Landon Collins may feel more comfortable taking this shot? Oh, it certainly makes you more of a target. Look, we all know what court of public opinion does to behavior. And all of a sudden, you know if this guy is low-hanging fruit, hey, I don't have to reach very far to get it because it's low hanging. And obviously, you don't want to take shots. First thing is you got to be a baller. We don't take shots at ballers unless we're about to ball with them. So when Landon is punching down at Dak after week one, he's basically saying, man, get back up here. If not, this is just the beginning of what's yet to come because everybody's going to pour on. That has something to do with it. Like, they may view him as a company man, and when you're a company man and you're not playing, oh. you're certainly going to get all the conversation. So he's getting all of the conversation because they don't believe his play is up to par, and then when you take the stance that he took, he's running counter to the culture. All right, to a quarterback defenses are afraid of, Drew Brees, who Saints host the Browns Sunday, and while Brees won't be going head-to-head -head with Browns' backup quarterback, Baker Mayfield, he did have some high praise for his fellow undersized quarterback, saying, quote, I think he can be a lot better than me. Man, he's got all the tools. He's more athletic. He probably can run around better. He's got a stronger arm. Listen, he's got all the tools. Uh, he's got all the tools, but he's got no proof. <laughs> he's got, I, he, that's great what he did in college. It's great what his, you know, arm strength and all that other stuff. But he's on the bench behind Terod Taylor. Love Drew Brees, but slow down a little bit here with the hyping of Baker Mayfield because someone might hear the comments and, and say, you're really not hyping Baker Mayfield, you're hyping yourself. Huh. Look what I've done, and my arm ain't that strong, and I ain't that fast, <laughs> and I ain't this, and I ain't that. Right. So, Drew, love you to death. Slow down. Pump the brakes here on Baker Mayfield. Oh, uh, well. I'm with Drew. Um, first, I, I was there day one, Drew Brees, drafted by the San Diego Chargers, and I'm there as a defensive player. And I remember hearing about our second-round choice that year, and everyone was saying, he's accurate, but he doesn't have an arm. He's not very mobile. I don't know how he's going to fit, in part why he dropped to the second round. And we immediately saw him from day one 
add gifts, add tools to that belt, which made him Drew Brees. But he is now, in a humble way, went back to his beginnings and said, what I am built for and what this dude is built like, that's more over there. And he's right. Baker Mayfield has a better arm. He's more mobile. And he, he is accurate. He won the Heisman. So I, I love when we always see a, a rookie coming to the league. It's like, what have you done? Um, up to this point, a all that lot. I could. <laughs> all that I could. All that I could. <laughs> like, I'm on pace to doing a lot if you just allow me a little patience. Man, you guys, I'll throw those verbal bouquets out there real quick. <laughs> I mean, look, Baker Mayfield was a solid prospect, but in watching Drew Brees as a prospect, that was my first year scouting, okay. there was something different. Like, he lit up the Big Ten, playing in Joe Tiller's offense. He was spectacular. Baker Mayfield has also been spectacular as a collegian. But in watching him in the preseason, He's been okay. Mm -hmm. But to say that he is going to be a guy that ranks in the top five in every major passing category, I'm not ready to give Baker Mayfield that title. Yeah. He hasn't even beat out Tyrod Taylor. You, I just need to see him play. You have to tap into what Drew Brees is tapping into. Oh. No one told Drew Brees, and I was there, as a second rounder, you're going to be top five. And so Drew was saying, with my limited skill set, I became top five. And you have more than me from day one? But Go I just don't it, believe brother. that he has more than Drew Brees. Drew Brees was a national-level tennis player. You got to beat Andy Roddick. I don't see that kind of athleticism for Baker Mayfield. Mm. I see him running around. Look, he's not an A-level athlete like a Russell Wilson oh, no. or a Michael Vick that's undersized. Typically, if you're an undersized player, you have to have some exceptional qualities. I'm still waiting to see what are those exceptional qualities for Baker Mayfield. Arm strength, who would you go with? Baker. Accuracy? I ain't so sure. Whoa, what? what? Can we have a combine out here? Do we need to <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, I would love to see Baker, Baker and Drew Mayfield. over there. Do you want to see them race? I mean, look, Baker Mayfield, a lot of his greatness in college was the improv, which comes from athleticism. That comes from getting off script and him making things happen outside the pocket. Marcel, that was a lot of Marcel, athleticism. I'm so shocked here. You're an Ivy League guy. You're one of the smartest guys to play in the NFL. Drew Brees, man, wins so much up here. Agreed. And the, the rap sheet on Baker is from the video of the cops to, to the planting the flag in the middle of the field to grabbing his crotch. He's not Drew Brees' is equal up here. And so if Drew Brees is a tick slower, a tick arms, lacks arm strength, what a, not as strong, blah, 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 if he can't match him here, it's curtains. Agreed. And that's not what Drew Brees is saying. No, Drew, no, I know. Yeah, Drew Brees is basically saying, you got more than me and I did a lot. So no, no, no. <laughs> go get it. But what I'm saying to Drew Brees is, I want to see this. Because yeah. all that other stuff, I've said, look, man, I grew up with the guy with the greatest arm ever. Oh, yeah. And so, but it's between the ears that separates these quarterbacks. And so Drew can hype him up all he wants about how fast he is, how strong his arm, and this and that. But, but we haven't seen proof yet, to me, that he's a mature guy that can run a team day to day to day under the spotlight of being a franchise quarterback. But that's the toughest part about evaluation, and Bucky could attest to this. The reason why it's always a crapshoot at the draft and the combine is because there's no measuring tape for the heart and for the brain. Like, we don't know if you really care about football anymore. We don't know if you're all in. We don't know if you're going to run through the next wall and the next wall until the end of time. I, so that's I just would think that if he was all of what Drew Brees is saying, would he be able to dismiss and knock out Tyrod Taylor in training camp early? Wouldn't there be a glimpse or something where the coaching staff is like, hey, Tyrod, hold on, bro. We're going to let... We, we didn't have to wait on him. We didn't have to wait on Drew. We didn't have to wait. Wasn't Drew Wait. out there as a rookie? Well, Doug Flutie was there first, but yeah, he got out there a little bit. Here, Bucky, you're too smart for this. You, I, I understand why. <laughs> Bucky, this is this is the Jeff Fisher plan. This is what they do. Uh -huh. And this what did he do for they, Jeff they, Fisher? They get a quarterback and then they sit them and then that buys them time and <laughs> runway until finally the sky falls and they say, okay, put them in, but. I get to stay another year, right? Hugh Jackson is doing the Jeff Fisher <laughs> plan, man. He ain't going to start that boy from day one and lose his job in the process. No, he's just buying time. All right, welcome back. Marcellus and I are joined now by Super Bowl champion Mark Schlereth. Let's move to Pittsburgh, where Antonio Brown apologized for threatening to punch reporter and my friend Jesse Washington, who wrote an in-depth piece on Brown's social media presence that rubbed the receiver the wrong way. While I like the way Tomlin handled questions about the social media side of this incident, it seems like every other week there's a new scandal coming out of Pittsburgh. 
and I think it reflects poorly on Tomlin. This is just another in a laundry list. I think, Mark, you said it earlier this week or at some point that they're a reality television show, mm -hmm. and eventually you got to say, you know, you got to question the director. Uh, I'm not sure if the Pittsburgh Steelers want a reality television show where every week there's a new controversy from uh, players criticizing Le'Veon Bell publicly to Le'Veon Bell's Twitter feed to Antonio Brown Facebook live in, in the locker room to threatening a reporter over social media. Some of this is going to take a toll on Mike Tomlin. Yeah, I'm glad you guys said reality show um, because the reality is the real about Mike Tomlin is he's doing an amazing job at what he can control, which is going out there, coaching his team, and winning ball games. Don't forget. Tied the uh, Browns last week, but go ahead. Uh, uh, don't forget, <laughs> though, uh, last year, all the turmoil, the Facebook controversy after the game and, and filming uh, Tomlin in a post-game speech and, and the anthem divided the locker room. They won 13 games. Don't forget that Tomlin, of all... Oh, you think they were satisfied in Pittsburgh? I, I didn't say that. I'm, oh, just, okay. I'm comparing them to his contemporaries. All right. And of, of, of all active coaches, he's only second to Bill Belichick and win percentage. Yeah. Mike Thomas never had a losing team, never as a head coach. Bill Belichick had five. So my point is, if you look at Mike Tomlin, you got to separate the signal from the noise. And trust me, the signal is this man is doing an amazing job of coaching these guys. See, I, I'm on a different page than you because, yeah, they've won a lot of games, but I would argue over the last six years, they're the most talented team in football, and they can't get into the playoffs and win consistently in the playoffs. They're that talented. And as far as doing a fantastic job of managing this team, like I thought the whole Antonio Brown, I'm not going to pay attention to the social media stuff. And that's the wrong message to send. Part of your contract when you sign it is to act like an adult. And that d deals with the media. That it's part of the contract that all of us sign is you have to act. The, I mean, you have to cooperate with the media. It's part of what sells this game. And you can't just say, I'm not worried about it, and I'm not going to pay attention to the social media aspect of that when one of your players is threatening one of your reporters. Like, that's, you cannot do that. Right. That's, that, that is completely Jacksonville, Jacksonville had that issue this, uh, this offseason, obviously, with Jalen Ramsey and the guys, and in the preseason, they made the suspension. Obviously, it was preseason. Feels like a slap on the wrist. They addressed right. it. Right. But here's the thing. How are we grading Mike Tomlin? Because if we're grading him based on distractions, then what happened in New England last year? And how would you grade Bill Belichick and what was going on there? Mm -hmm. They still went to the Super Bowl, but that was a team that was supposed to implode. Everyone was shooting at them and saying it was eroding from the inside. Trainers getting kicked off a no, team, playing Marcel, everything. What's, uh -uh. How are we grading let's, him? Let's say that the grade is based on if me and you did a 100-yard dash uh -oh. and, and I ran a 15-flat and you ran an 11-5, yep. people might still say, man, that's pretty good for Whitlock. He's 50, he's fat as hell. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> right, right. And so, but, but, so what I'm saying about Mike Tomlin is, and what Mark is saying is like, he's Usain Bolt. He's in the Pittsburgh organization with all the tools. Mm. And we don't want silver medals. We want Usain Bolt to run through the finish line, get the gold. He's supposed to be an all-time great. That's my thing with Mike. I like Mike Tomlin. Again, I, I'll still even defend him on the social media thing. I don't think this was the right example with the Antonio Brown deal, but I like his overall message. I think Mike Tomlin is a very good coach. I think he can be an elite and all-time great, and that's where my disappointment right. is. My, yeah. my deal with him is, for instance, you should have addressed your players before they had open locker room on Wednesday before the first game and said, Le'Veon Bell, is, there's a moratorium on speaking about him. We are preparing to play the Cleveland Browns. This is week one, and we go into battle with who we go into battle with. Right. And that guy is, we, I had a coach, my offensive line coach in Denver, Alex Gibbs. If somebody got hurt or somebody wasn't around, you know what he said about that guy? He's dead. Dude <laughs> is dead. We move on. The guy's dead. Until he gets here, he's dead. And the fact that you distracted from your preparation to face the Cleveland Browns, and you can't tell me it didn't affect you on Sunday because I watched the game and I watched Ben Roethlisberger throw picks, and, and I watched a team that had a lead in the fourth quarter, 21-7, to seven, choke it up, just cough it up. Like, you can't – it's so hard to win games in this league and to have a coach that didn't say, hey, guys, we're not going to focus on that. We're only focused on the game. 
that to me is that's not how you win championships and that's a problem for me because they've got too much talent not to have another couple of championships under their belt well they've been to two Super Bowls one one this is a coach mm -hmm. very few coaches can have that said about their resume and the, the fact that it's funny we we can't pick on him in terms of wins and losses no 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 so no. then we say well you should have won more but it's like win more where or how like the Patriots have had five of the last 17 championships. So you look at the other 12, and they're sprinkled. I think they're sprinkled out there. There's no one else saying, let me claim I think a Tomlin can, I think Tomlin can be on Bill Belichick's level. That's what I want to okay. see, and that's where my criticism comes from. It's like, trust me, it's like if my father was still alive, as great as I've done, he no, 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 you can do much better. Agree with that. I agree right. with that. Okay. To a guy whose reputation is getting a boost right now, Adrian Peterson, Peterson had a surprisingly big week one for the Redskins, but it sounds like he might be feeling himself a little too much, saying he thinks the idea of breaking Emmitt Smith's rushing record is, quote, very realistic. But Peterson's still about 6,000 yards shy of Emmitt and has barely been hanging on in the league the last few years. I think he's delusional here to believe he can still catch Emmitt Smith. He had a great first week with Arizona last year. Yeah, too. remember that? Yeah, yeah. great. And with all oh, Emmitt's back. And, and or I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> Adrian's too. back. Uh, and remember when Emmett went out to Arizona? I think he had a great early yeah. start. But anyway, right. I, I think uh, Adrian's been a little delusional here. He doesn't have another six thousand yards, and he, he would need six seasons to get there. In my opinion, ain't happening. Yeah, look, he won't do it. I'm with you there. But he's not crazy for saying he'll try to do it. I mean, there's certain guys we say in the locker room they're gonna ball till they fall. Like. They are all in for the game. And, and Adrian Peterson is a different beast than most beasts in the NFL. Dude, tore his knee and was playing like three days later. Like, didn't care at all. If you know his mental makeup and his physical dynamics, he's like LeBron in that sense. Like, that grown country, grown man strength from day one. You don't get that in the weight room. And then he goes in the weight room and gets that as well. I'm just saying, if he gets the opportunities... That will be a pace of 1,000 yards, which I think is a, a little excessive in a league where the running back seems minimized. Uh, I don't see him getting it, but I see him certainly exhausting all opportunities to try. I mean, if that offensive line in Washington stays healthy this year, he could have a big season, like a 1,200-yard season. I, I believe that to be true about him. He is a freak show. Do I think he's going to get another 6,000 yards in this league? No. Would I bet against him? No, exactly. I remember I remember Darren Woodson telling me a story that Adrian Peterson walks in the locker room of the Dallas Cowboys from a, as a high school player when Darren Woodson was playing for the Cowboys and the players thought they just signed a new running back. They were like, <laughs> he's like, he could have come right off the high school field and started for us. He was that dynamic, that big, that strong. He's an absolute freak show. And I, I know that um, Gruden, his, Jake Gruden said, he came in here when we signed him and he put all the kids to shame. Mm. What kind of shape he was in, what kind of strength he had. Like, they were all like, oh, man, I got to pick it up. Right. So, yeah, we're like, I, I'm not going to give him 6,000 yards. So, no. I'm with you on that. Give but I'm like, that. the guy is a, this guy, guy is a different breed this now. This sounds like the Tom Brady conversation we continuously have. And I've heard people say, he's going to fall off a cliff five years ago. Okay, in two more years, he's going to fall off a cliff. Oh, next... Stop looking at the birth certificate all the time. The numbers that matter is what this dude is putting up. And off of one week performance, looks like he still has a lot to take. You know, here's what I always say, and, and I truly believe this. In order to be great, you have to be delusional. Yeah. Oh, even yeah. to put your mind in a place yeah. yep. like to be that. great, mm -hmm. you have to be delusional. I think everybody in the NFL right. suffers from delusion. Because it, if they really thought about the game, it's like, man, this is crazy. We're doing this to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we're, you got to be slightly touched. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you do. And then the guys who are do, just great over, they're, they're really touched. Really <laughs> touched. Like psychosis. <laughs> like Charles Haley. Haley yeah. and all that yeah. stuff. And it's LT. And, yeah. you, and you brought up a great point in talking about why you are delusional. It doesn't start when you get to the NFL. It's to get to the NFL. You're one in a million. You're walking around a neighborhood and you're 11 years old and everybody laughing at you. Oh, you, oh, oh keep that ball. Keep playing ball. You look good. You, I went to your game. They laughing at you. You're not going to make it. And, and once you make it and you look around and then you become AD, Adrian Peterson in the league, of course the guy's going to believe he could do all things. All right, so I came up with a little meme for Adrian Peterson off the Nike deal. 
Uh, believe in delusions, even if it means making a fool of yourself in the media. So, oh, uh, <laughs> no, what? <laughs> what? No. All right. All right, joining us now is a guy who knows a little something about Texas versus USC, Vince Young. Vince, I know it's been a crazy week for you in Austin. It reminds, you know, Austin's kind of like Muncie, Indiana. I played at Ball State. You know, you were a Texas legend. I was a Ball State legend. This has got to be a crazy week for you in Austin. Oh, uh, man, just a blessing, man, and just to reminisce with my teammates. Uh, I even got Lindell White in town with me. Uh, I was just with uh, Matt Liner in L.A. Uh, two days ago, so it's just a good, you know, memorable moment for all of us, but also just happy to see the younger guys get an opportunity to compete and understand how huge the, the rivalry is now against Texas and USC game. You're getting inducted into the Rose Bowl Hall of Fame. How excited are you about this honor? Uh, very excited. I mean, just knowing Coach Brown just went uh, this, this year as well, and just knowing how much hard work pays off to, to get to that point. You know, me being a little skinny kid from Houston, Texas, man, all the hard work that I put in with, you know, my, my coaches, my trainers, and then just working hard with my teammates, man. It's just a, a, a truly great feeling and a blessing. Yeah, I'm glad, VY, you said how huge this game is. And we all know how huge the program of University of Texas football is. But recently, you guys got dethroned by Texas A&M <laughs> as college football's most valuable team. How'd you feel about that, that now y'all second place? Yeah, it's all good. You know, we gotta we gotta share the love. You know what I mean? <laughs> Texas A and M, we love them guys, but we gotta share the love a little bit. <laughs> share the love? No, nah, you don't want to share the money. I mean, you can share the love, but you nah, guys, them numbers are not right, so don't worry about that, big guy. <laughs> oh, okay. You gonna write the check? I, I gotta be. I'm not buying that. Texas A and M on the same level as Texas. I, I just don't buy it. That, that seems silly to me. <laughs> all right, let's let's talk about this game. Longhorn <laughs> head coach Tom Herman. Still needs a signature win to prove he's the right guy in Austin. Agree or disagree? Well, I mean, I, I disagree. I mean, you know, Tom has proved himself doing some really good things at U of H and, you know, building his career to where he at today. I don't really buy into it. You know, I, I just, you know, the whole world saying that he needs to win a big game, but he's just only been here for two years, and it's not easy to coach at University of Texas. So you got to continue doing what you're doing. Stop worrying about what everybody else is talking about and continue to do what you're doing for the young men over there is making sure they buying into what you're doing, your coaching, and uh, everything going to fall into play. I'm always going to have beliefs. They can't do wrong in my eyes. I don't really care what nobody else is talking about. You know, burn on to Kamara's all day. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, let's keep it X and O's. Uh, Vincent, you talk about how a lot of top programs in college football, they're going to a two-quarterback approach. And... Do you think that's sustainable? And how would you have felt if that happened while you were quarterback? Well, actually, it did go down like that when I was playing. So it, went all, it was always a split, you know, who was going to play. But at the same time, you can tell how, you know, the, the game is changing. You know, we hate to give us defensive coordinators uh, uh, some, some love, but they also starting to get better as defensive quarterback coordinators as well. And you got to have that one-two punch. I mean, you know, somebody might not have a really good game, you got to have that second quarterback ready to go. Just like at a running back position, you see a lot of guys in the NFL and in in college level got the one-two punch. So you got to have two guys, um, you know, pushing each other, competing against each other to stay ready because it's better for the team. So, uh, but in the same time, I, I, I agree with it. And whatever happens, I just hope Shang, Shang and Sam understand, you know, we're going to need both of them guys to win ball games this year. All right, on the USC side, they, they're playing a true freshman, JT Daniels, <laughs> who really is supposed to be in high school this year. Vince, you didn't get onto the field until your redshirt freshman year. How much pressure do you think is on JT Daniels stepping out of high school onto the USC starting quarterback job playing Texas? It's tough. I mean, TJ, I know it's tough, but the main thing he has to do is, is don't listen to the outside world and pay attention to his coaching staff. Uh, you know, call, pick up the phone, call Matt Liner. I mean, you got, you know, Carson Palmer. You got so, so many guys, you know, that you can call and get advice from. And just don't worry about the social media and all those things. Focus on what you need to do is buying in and winning your teammates, uh, pushing your teammates to play the best that they can be. 
You know, that's what he has to do right now. Don't worry about what everybody else is talking about. Just lean on the mentors and the people you have that went through that, uh, that university and just use that and use your coaching staff. And I really feel like he'll be okay. I know it's tough. I know it's tough, but at the same time, you got people around you can help you get through that situation. Last time we saw you play, Vince, you were in the CFL playing for the Rough Riders. Have you given up on playing professional football? Definitely. Shout out to the Saskatchewan, baby. Appreciate y'all love, baby. <laughs> it's a wrap. Right now, it's a wrap. So I'm enjoying being a, a flag football coach for my son. <laughs> and then also just helping out being on campus at UT, sitting in the meeting room, or doing private workouts for a lot of, a lot of young quarterbacks that's going to be coming up. And Jalen Hurts down in Alabama, man. Proud of you, man. Keep fighting through it, big guy. Vince, what do you think of Johnny Manziel going to the CFL? Do you think that's the right path for him to get back into the NFL? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of Johnny, man. He's going through a lot. He went through a lot, man. And he really loves the games, as you can tell, as you can see. So I'm, I'm glad he played in that spring league. And I'm glad that he's trying to, you know, further his career. I mean, you, just, you know, a, a lot of things happen. You know, a lot of mature things happen in his life. So I, I'm just happy that he's growing and continuing to fight and not listen to everybody telling you to just give up on what you love doing every day. So I'm proud of you. Never let nobody tell you what to do, man. Just keep working and keep fighting. If it don't happen, but at least you tried. So I'm happy he's trying, at least. Yeah, Vince, you're a great player for this question. Uh, we saw Lamar Jackson go out there in week one NFL. Uh, you, used in multiple <laughs> positions. You know that position. You know how you can affect the game in various ways. You think that they're utilizing him effectively, and will it work? Yeah, I mean, the game is changing, man. The game is changing, and, you know, I hate to say this, the defense is getting good, and they fast, they moving around. So, uh, you know, the biggest thing is I want Lamar to do is what I told him, man, get with your defensive coordinator, man, and ask him questions. What would you do to me uh, if you was playing me? You know, take the time out, sit with your defensive line coach, sit with your linebackers coach, sit with your DB coach. You know, do these things behind the scene when you have time. Because when it's your ball getting you, when they give you the keys to that starting position job, you have to be ready. But I do like what they're doing with him. They're getting themselves prepared to play. They're using the talent that he has. And everything else is going to fall into play of, you know, making those right reads in the NFL. Because it's not easy. When you get that pre-snap read, that ball getting in your hand, they might show you one thing and it's a whole total different thing. So it's a fast game. But I really feel like the hard work that he's putting in, he's going to catch on to it and more reps at practice and in game situation, he's going to continue to get better and better. Vince, very quickly, and I don't want to stereotype you, but you kind of look like a mix of Tiger Woods and Michael <laughs> Jordan right now. <laughs> Did you just get off the golf course? Or yeah. what, what's going on here? Right. <laughs> I appreciate that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. man, I got I had a uh, I had an event going on from a Vince Young Foundation uh, and got just got through getting off the golf course and had some special Olympic kids out there swinging the golf clubs and just having fun with, you know, some USC guys, Lindell White is in town and my old universe, uh, UT guy teammates. So just give doing some money, raising some money for the community, man. And, you know, always giving back like we always do. Quickly, I, Vince, uh, how much does USC beat Texas by this weekend? Quickly. Oh, that sounds that sounds horrible, man. <laughs> hey, bro, hey. do not do not disrespect us like that, man. I will fly up there right now and get up on you, bro. <laughs> bring, Thank bring. you, Vince. Great oh, job. No Thanks, Vince. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it, man. All right, welcome back. Marcellus and I disagree about a lot, including social media. He loves it. I hate it. Here to convince me that it's not as terrible as I think is our social media manager. Ball State, Warren Central alum. Yes, sir. Darnell Smith. Love that shirt you have on, Darnell. I love the hat you got on. Can you, uh, <laughs> first of all, stop the love affair between Ball State. Uh, can you give him his proper title? What's that? Two-star recruit. Two-star recruit. Ball State yeah, baller. Recruit. Better than you at Warren Central. You're only five foot eight. 280-pound uh, uh, nose tackle to ever make all conference Monster. in history. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Just, down there, what you got? Yeah, let's start with LeBron James, who just fought his new teammate, JaVale McGee, on Instagram, which got a lot of people pointing out that JaVale had posted almost three years ago saying LeBron had blocked him. Are you surprised LeBron would care enough to block JaVale? I'm shocked. You shocked? I, I, literally, because I, I don't mm. get the whole... I get if someone says something really ridiculous and inappropriate, you block them over Twitter. 
but blocking another NBA player, I, I, I've seen this from these professional athletes. There's a lot of sensitive, tender guys. <laughs> tender? Tender guys. That's the word? Yeah, tender. We're very tender. <laughs> That's very not tender. it, man. First of all, you know as a celebrity that I'm not a celebrity. I'm a journalist. Go ahead. Uh oh, that's what you want to stay with. <laughs> with that hat on, that's how you type? <laughs> okay, do you? Um, it's brand cultivation. Social media is used a lot for especially guys like a LeBron. Brand cultivation. Now, LeBron's saying, okay, it's, I can't follow everybody. I can't do everything on social media that I want to because I'm brand conscious. And then I can't be associated with even some of you for obvious reasons, whether you're going to be shacked in the fool on social media and bringing it to me. It's a little Jay-Z Kanye, like, you my boy, you my dog, make my beats. Ah, we can't really hang anymore because we ain't cool with all the Kim K stuff. So I think that LeBron's just like, look, I don't want to be associated with anybody who's not taking this as serious as I am. I could be a little bit out of my loop. Do they have a mute button yes. on, on yes. IG? I know they got it on Twitter. They do. Do they have it on IG? Uh, mute? Uh, I, not on Instagram. Instagram. No, 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 not a mute yeah, button. You got to so go. Maybe, yeah, if he could mute him, maybe he would have just muted him on right. Instagram. Yeah, but, what's up with the social media manager not knowing that answer? Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's, there's no, there's, I had to think about it for a quick second. Yeah, it's not a mute button on there. <laughs> OK, go ahead. You'll get me to Twitter off. What's, the, what's next? Let's move on to the fastest man on Earth, Usain Bolt who tweeted out a video of him having fun in zero gravity, including smoking some astronauts in a race. Do you think they let him win? Uh, no, they did not let him win. But when you said smoking some astronauts or whatever, <laughs> I was like, where is he going with this? And who's smoking what? <laughs> it is legal. <laughs> threw me, it's legal out here. It's legal. <laughs> <laughs> threw me completely off. Uh, but yeah, did they let him win? No, you ain't got to let him win. He gonna take that. Thank you. Did, did Justin Gatlin let him win? Like, <laughs> this, Usain Bolt, one, he's still gonna get off on the gun. Whatever the set, go, he's out. And two, them strides, man. That, that dude ate up half that track on the first step. So they ain't let him win. I don't see that. You know, you know, we're gonna talk to Charlie Dixon after the show and ask about Darnell's drug test before the oh, <laughs> man. job. Oh, the smoking thing. But it was what, I'm, 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 I'm clean. I'm good. Fine. <laughs> 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 Let's move on to the WNBA where Brianna Stewart and the Seattle Storm just won the title, but writer Charlotte Clymer didn't see much to celebrate, tweeting, quote, FYI, Brianna Stewart's WNBA salary this year is $56,000. The minimum NBA salary this past season was $562,000, about 10 times the salary of the 2018 WNBA MVP. Revenue, et cetera, et cetera, I got you. I hear your rebuttals. What I'm saying is these athletes don't get the respect. Does she have a point? No. And, and I'm going to go to a Whitlockism. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> These guys, we have, we're building a society where people think we're going to give people what they deserve rather than what they earn. Mm, and there's a big difference say between it. what you deserve and what you earn. Because, it get, seriously, and I, I say this in all seriousness, it'll sound like a joke, but based off what I deserve, Tamron Hall should be all up <laughs> on me, all of my Twitter, the whole thing. That's what I deserve. Right. Have I earned it? No. And so we got to stop this silliness of everybody gets what they deserve. I'm with you there, man. Uh, especially in pro sports, and especially talking about a league that's being subsidized by the NBA and a league that is hemorrhaging and losing money every single year. And look, I, I like women's basketball, not to the point that I'm a passionate fan and I go, but I've been to a few games most of the time, empty arenas. And then if you talk about sports, meritocracy, core of it is competition. Guess what? You eat what you kill. If your league is not killing it, there's not going to be much for you guys to eat. Just that simple. Frankly, I've been killing it because I'm eating a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, everything. Darnell, what's next? Let's move to boy genius Sean McVay, who showed off his crazy good memory before, but just had it put to the test again when Bleacher Report asked him, about plays that happened way back when he's with the Redskins in 2015. Check it out. Now we are going to go to, this is Sean McVay's time in Washington. Oh, no. So we're bringing like it. it back to 2015, week seven. Bucks at Skins. Yep. Second and seven on the Tampa Bay 24. 58 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Jamison Crowder wheel route down the right sideline. <laughs> Jamison Crowder, we were out down the right sideline, set up the first down, and then how did that drive end? Jordan Reed touchdown and a four by one individual ISO slant. And what meme was that game? You like that. <laughs> mm. Is that impressive I, I, or staged? 
Mm. Well, it's impressive. I don't think it's staged, but but look, mm. look, I, it's not that impressive to me. My family can tell you, and I, I know I always go to these jokes, but it's, it's just <laughs> this one is actually the truth. I can tell you what we had for Thanksgiving dinners every year of my life because <laughs> my mother and my auntie are that good at cooks, and I know what they did year to year to year, and I could sit around and tell my oh, in '78. Them yams, mama man. Okay, uh, okay. Well, then, all right, all right. I'm about to quiz you. Put you on the spot. Let's see if you're not lying or one of them jokes. <laughs> what did y'all have in '83, boy? In '83, yeah, 83 my boy. mother first started making uh, oyster gravy. No, oyster dressing mm. with gravy. Ooh. If you've never had dressing with oysters, it's amazing. She started in '83. We were at Nottingham Village. Apartments. Yes, sir. Oh, I don't know what I'm talking mm, about. I'm glad I missed uh, my area. Oh, oyster all, gravy. Oh, <laughs> oyster dressing and gravy. It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, uh, my mother will be out here probably around Christmas time. I'm going to hook you up. She'll look. I'll bring my auntie out here too if I have to. <laughs> Makes the, the best macaroni family, right? and cheese you'll ever eat in your hey, life. Hey, newsflash, there are geniuses in the world, and that's for yeah, stomach baby. I'm, Come on. Yeah. <laughs> He's a genius. He just yeah. got a good memory. There's a difference between a memory and a genius. Uh, and he could call great plays, and yeah, he changed the culture. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> All right, today we're talking about Serena Williams, who's gotten a lot of love for her anti-sexism rant at the U.S. Open last week, including from Warriors star Steph Curry, who says Serena handled the whole controversy with, quote, grace and class. You can add Steph to the list of athletes and celebs caping up for Serena, but not me, Marcellus. Mm -hmm. I'm taking her down three points in my approval rating. B another fall on character. Uh, for me with Serena and this whole U.S. Open situation. Knocked her down a couple points also in authenticity. She goes from a 76 to a 73. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, I, I don't know how that landed for Serena's brand. Some people are on one side saying, you know what, wait for you to go out there and talk about the grander issues. But then some people looked at it as like, it's grandstanding. You were losing to someone who you shouldn't have been losing to. You got emotional, and then all of a sudden, you decide to grandstand. I understand that division on this one. But for me, Serena, of course, still <laughs> the greatest. Uh, I have her 25 in all-time greatness. We're not even going to argue that. Uh, I agree with that one. Job performance? I actually moved it up, and let me tell you how I got here. Uh, she has not won a title or a Grand Slam since she's returned from, from the birth of her child, but she did make it to the finals of the U.S. Open, so she's climbing her way back to the status of who she once was. I went up there, too. I'm actually higher than you. I got a 23 at job. Exactly. Yep. So you look at that, and the character, no scandals off the court, just passion misperceived. Uh, uh, is it a Tom Brady passion cursing out the coach? Or is it a Dez Bryant passion where it's like, yo, you're a little disruptive? I, I don't know how people receive that, but for me, it's just passion with her, and I always will support her because she's the best ever at it. I, this is where we have the disagreement of why you have her still at Hall of Fame approval rating, I don't, or uh, very, very high in approval rating. I have her down. It's about the character issue, and this is what I'll say, Marcellus, mm -hmm. and this will be a much deeper conversation that we'll have over time, but I think a lot of times we give great performers, music, athletics, whatever, oh, because they're great at that, we assume they have great character. Yeah. I actually assume the opposite. The more talent you have, I think it's harder for you to actually have character because the world caters to you almost from birth and you're never, virtually never told the truth and you focus so much on your physical gifts that a lot of times the other things that make someone a great person you're allowed to ignore. I look at my own history. I peaked, and I'm not joking, I peaked as an athlete in eighth grade. Hmm. And ever since I started in that athletic decline, I got better and better as a person, and I say that seriously. Because when I was young, I was not the best person. The more athletic you get, the more I got away with. I can still even think, you know, even in high school, I was a pretty good athlete. And they let me get away with all kinds of things in high school that others wouldn't have been able to. So I just make the other assumption, more talent, Harder to have high character. You know what? They call that the curse of the gifted. And, and that's what it is. If you see a guy who can run like that, jump like that, pass like that, all that, it's like, what's wrong with him? And, and look, and that's how it goes. And it's a seesaw effect. A lot of times you get humbled. The guy who's so talented doesn't have the same mechanics necessarily as a guy who doesn't have as much talent and athleticism. I understand that. But with the character argument, here's why I think you're wrong on Serena. 
because the spotlight's on her like a LeBron James. Like, we knew she was coming. And not only has she exceeded expectations, she faced resistance. And I don't know of the scandal off the court. Stop I the just scandal. don't know. I think she's spoiled and bratty. And I think this incident was another example of her being spoiled and bratty. Well, in that moment, look, that's not her higher self. Like, her, the highest of Serena is not going to complain when it's, I'm losing a match and I want to take it to another issue. All that's right. The as much as I love this show, my favorite thing on this network right now is Lock It In and Rachel Bonetta. She works with three clowns, but she's awesome. <laughs> there it Let is. me help you out, Rachel, and help those guys out. Take Baltimore minus one and a half. Pay your mortgage pick.